Ishuma. I'm now going to read the verse for the day, and it comes from Luke um, 15, 1 to 7. Luke 15, Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to 7, and it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And that's the word of the Lord. Amen. We thank God that far he has brought us in the service and I believe that you are continuing to be blessed and it's a special time. Thank you Teacher Eva for leading us. Uh, Teacher Eva, uh, I also serve in Sunday school and currently I'm helping as the children's pastor and I can say that Teacher Eva has been a blessing to Sunday school. And uh, I can say from all through her, I can be able to teach toddlers and preschoolers. I can stay with them the entire session. And I've done it because I have watched her teach. And I can say she has been a blessing to Sunday school. And we are blessed at Sunday school to have such teachers. And this particular time I'm here, to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Mr. or Dr. Anderson, David Anderson, is not new to us. Uh, he's been here several times. We are trying to, 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 to find out how many times he has been here. And we were like, should be more than three times. Uh, so he's a long time friend of current community church. Uh, we were looking for a speaker for today some time back. And in God's ways, Teacher Eva called and she, she mentioned that Dr. Anderson, who happens to be art, is, okay, is <laughs> art, his teacher, and I believe he still his, will be around this time. And we felt that was God's connection. And we said we were actually looking for a guest speaker for today. And we thank God for him. Uh, he is passionate about special education and disability studies. And he has always challenged us to embrace, to support, and to help those who are living with, the, with disability uh, so that they can be able to, go to know what God has for them. And not only that, he has challenged us to learn from them. So he's the founder of Crossing Bridges, a non-profit ministry focusing on disability ministry. And he has authored five books. He's married uh, with three grown daughters and eight grandchildren. And we thank God for him and for bringing him to us today. And I would like to invite him to come uh, so that I can pray for him. And I know he came with a, with a guest also, and uh, he will be able to introduce him. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. Let me pray for you. 
Lord, we continue coming uh, into your presence. We believe that you are here with us this uh, day. Thank you for bringing your servant, uh, Dr. Anderson, to us today. And we thank you because we know that you have sent him with your word to us. Lord, we pray for him as he delivers your message to us, that will enable him by the power of your Holy Spirit to speak with boldness and with clarity, and that, Lord, you will open our hearts that will be able to hear your word, that which your purpose for us to hear today. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to even go ahead and put into practice that which you will speak to us today. So, Lord, we thank you, and we know that you are here with us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I thought they turned it on, did it not? Oh, okay. Sir. There we go. <laughs> As I was saying, it's, it's been more than three times uh, that I've had the privilege of sharing from God's Word with Karen Community Church, but uh, I couldn't pinpoint exactly how many. I don't know even if I looked at my computer and tried to trace back if I'd be able to figure it out, but it's, it's been more than three times, and it's a privilege always to, to be with you, um, especially today, because this will probably be my last time to come to Kenya. Uh, I've been here, I want to say, 25 times over the years since 1997, uh, and most of the time working with Eva uh, and things that she sets up for me to do and then coming to the church here but I'm getting old. Uh, I stood up when she asked about May birthdays. Uh, I have one on the 28th, and I will be older than that. Uh, Luke chapter 15 has uh, three parables that we're probably very much familiar with. The one that was read about the, the lost sheep quickly followed in Luke's account by the parable of the lost coin and then followed by the parable of the lost son, or the prodigal son, as we often refer to him. And they each have the same uh, structure to them. Something is lost, something that's lost is sought for, and the lost is found. And also each of the three parables ends with a, a type of celebration. We read in the, pastor, in the passage that the, when the sheep was found, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no, repent, no repentance. For the coin, uh, there was joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And for the son, it is fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The one about the parable about the, the lost uh, sheep is certainly familiar to, to most Christian, Christ, Christians. <laughs> um, I tell you, I'm getting old. Uh, the words are comforting to uh, children and adults because they communicate God's love uh, to us and the idea of being carried in Jesus' arms or on his shoulders. Jesus. Reference to the shepherd would likely have been understood by the Jews who were hearing him uh, to reference the, the shepherd of Israel, 
perhaps recalling David's words in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We all find comfort in thinking of that verse and what it's really telling us. Or they might think of Jesus' description of himself in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Or in uh, a little bit, few verses later, I am the good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me. I lay down my life for my sheep. I want us to, to take a closer look at the parable of the lost sheep and, and uh, give it a different focus than we typically uh, take when, when people see that verse. And as was said, I've, my passion is dealing with uh, special education and, and disability ministry. Uh, so it's very difficult for me to read any portion of the body with, of the Bible without seeing some reference or, or some way it refers to uh, people with disabilities and our responsibility to them. Jesus in the parable says the shepherd has a hundred sheep. And as a good shepherd, uh, the shepherd would know the names of all of those sheep. Now, we wouldn't because they all look the same to us. They're all furry and or fuzzy and they all, they're all white usually, unless they've been in the dirt. Uh, but the shepherd who has, lives with them and, and in a sense serves them, knows them. He knows them uh, by name. And that points to a very close, uh, intimate connection between the shepherd and his sheep. But one sheep has wandered away, as Matthew says it in his account, or become lost, as Luke says. This uh, parable is similar to the, the second parable, very similar to the parable of the lost coin. So many understand these, both these first two parables along the same lines as the parable of the prodigal son who squandered his uh, inheritance through sinful pleasure. So we often think the lost sheep has sinned, but in, that was the case, we're all lost sheep, as we've all sinned. There's nothing in the parables that uh, suggests in either the, the coin or the, the uh, sheep that there's sin involved, particular sin involved. Can an animal sin? I don't think so. Uh, much less can a coin sin. I doubt that too. We might use it sinfully, <laughs> but it's not the coin that's sinning, it's us. The idea of some sin is something we attribute to the sheep nonetheless and to the coin, perhaps influenced by that third parable where there was sin involved, uh, the parable of the, the prodigal son who did go astray and uh, gave himself over to sinful activity. Perhaps we can say that the sheep is different from the other sheep because it seems to have sought isolation in some way. Um, maybe there was a spot of grass that was greener than he decided to go and, and try that one out or something. But um, that's similar to sometimes to what we do when we, we but it's, it's attributing human emotions to the sheep. And we are not sheep in the literal sense. This sheep is different from the rest. He wandered off, the others stayed together. But to label the lost sheep as representing a sinner may be the exact opposite of what Jesus uh, wants us to see or understand uh, in this parable. A different, very different meaning than what he intended. The sheep did not sin. The fault lies with the shepherd who lost his sheep. Perhaps Jesus wants us to see the failure or sinfulness of the shepherd in this parable, not something of the sheep. Um, it suggests a, a similar failure uh, to me, uh, a similar failure 
uh, or sinfulness, if you will, uh, of a community or of a church that sees itself as complete even though one is missing. There are still churches, many, many, many churches in the world that will not allow a person with a disability to be part of the church or even to come into the worship service unless they confess and are healed, which doesn't happen. Uh, not much since Jesus' time. Uh, so maybe Jesus is trying to get us to think about ourselves, not about the lost sheep. Uh, he does not say the sheep has sinned uh, by becoming lost. Rather, the focus is on the shepherd who lost the sheep. Um, the shepherd did not do something to cause the sheep to go astray. Uh, he did not intend for the sheep to become lost. Uh, the shepherd was most was was not excommunicating him from the from the flock. I'm trying to read my scribble there, and I have trouble reading my handwriting, so I always type things. Uh, why then does Jesus uh, end the parable by saying there's going to be a joy over one sinner who repents? Well, we'll come back to that later. For now, realizing that the, this uh, sheep, uh, one sheep is missing, the shepherd ha turns his focus on finding that sheep. So he leaves the other 99 uh, with uh, the other shepherds. They usually traveled in, in in groups uh, with their own flocks and again needing to know then who are mine and who are yours. Uh, but uh, he leaves them in the care of the, the other shepherds while he goes to search for this one uh, who has uh, lost. Again, emphasizing the importance uh, of every sheep. Because he's a shepherd, not the owner of the flock, his boss is going to hold him accountable for the lost sheep, for all the sheep rather. Uh, God will hold us accountable for his sheep and how we serve them and seek them. So Jesus is emphasizing the shepherd's care uh, for the, his flock. And as a good shepherd, Jesus says, lays down his life for the sheep. Or in Matthew's account, it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That maybe is uh, more uh, directly relevant to where I'm taking us in looking at this parable. When the sheep, the lost sheep is found, the shepherd is filled with joy and he invites his friends to, enjoy, to engage in celebration with him. Uh, do we celebrate when someone becomes a Christian? We welcome them. Uh, we, we baptize them. Uh, they're, they're part of our body, but do we celebrate them? Do we really rejoice that someone has come to know the Lord and has repented and has joined the flock? Are there any missing sheep in your flock? And I'm not referring to empty chairs. <laughs> Are there missing sheep? In, in your flock. I would suggest that some sheep who are missing from the church's flock, not this church and every church, uh, are individuals and families who are struggling with issues related to disability. But the question for the church is, are they missing from the flock because the church has failed to look for them or to welcome them in, into the fellowship, or worse, because we believe them not to be worthy of our fellowship, whether it's a mild disability or a severe, very severe disability. Do we consider them not worthy of our fellowship? Does God consider them not worthy of fellowship with him? One answer might be yes, but the second answer should be no. He does not consider them unworthy. Of course, uh, we believe them, uh, or, or have, having gone missing, uh, re, uh, I'm thinking of that as in terms of the person who, or the family that's dealing uh, with a disability. But have they gone missing because the able-bodied people in the churches, including a pastoral staff and elders who, because of 
faulty theology or not really thinking theologically about these issues have driven the sheep away or allowed them to become lost. Perhaps they feel that by doing so they're keeping the church pure or that they're building a church that will be a greater, better example to the world because everybody's able-bodied, everybody's together, everybody's part of the flock. Uh, but are they doing that? Does it keep the church pure if we resist, resist or reject people with disabilities as part of our fellowship? Um, to ignore or disinvite them, uh, persons with disabilities, communicates that these are people we don't think are worthy of the church's fellowship. Or maybe we don't even think are worthy of God's love. Um, but are, is that true? Does becoming a Christian mean you no longer sin? Can anybody raise your hand if you no longer sin once you became a Christian? Anybody? Good, you're honest. <laughs> um, sin is always with us until we end our lives and are with Christ himself. Uh, so to blame a person who has a disability for, for sinning, uh, which is the cause of the disability in, that, in the person's mind, is, is ridiculous, if you maybe can, can be that blunt. The point is that Jesus' story is less about the missing sheep, but more about the, the shortcomings of the shepherd or the church community, let's say, who ignore and, dis, and sometimes disinvite people with disabilities and even their whole families from fellowship, supposing that to be disabled or to have a, a disabled family member uh, means you're sinners or you have a very shallow faith and many have been accused of that. Some of you may know who Johnny Erickson Tada is. A uh, young woman at, at the age of 17, when she was a young woman, uh, broke her neck and is paralyzed from really from the shoulders down uh, and has lived a very difficult life because of the limitations, but a very successful life because of her Lord and Savior and what he has done in her life and what he has done through her life around the world. So, uh, but when she was first disabled, there were some people from her youth group that said, uh, we have to pray. And they would come oh, and pray and lay, lay hands on her. Even one, her boyfriend at the time was, was one of these, the leaders of this. But when she was not healed, they deserted her. They broke off fellowship with her. That's not what Jesus is telling us to do through this parable. Um, our cultural and our religious thinking teaches us that it's the sheep's responsibility to change if they want to fit into our congregation. I should put that in the form of a question. Is that uh, our, our assumption? Um, is our self-righteous re uh, requirement that the sheep change, they confess, they repent, they be healed, actually a form of violence to those individuals. Do we think we are acting out of love when displaying an attitude of judgment or blaming a, a person or his parents for the disability, saying that their sin, their lack of confession, their limited faith has brought about this disability? Do we believe that not reaching out to people with disabilities and their families with the love of Jesus is something that God will bless? Not, not reaching out in ignorance because you haven't thought about it, but intentionally not reaching out. Will God bless us for that? I mentioned Johnny. I have a couple of other friends. Uh, Cordell Brown, who has cerebral palsy, a uh, difficult life. Uh, but made it through school, learned how to be an auto mechanic on his own time, uh, decided he wanted to go to Bible school. But the, when he got into the, hit the dorm, his roommate showed up and was shocked because Cordell's disability was quite visible. 
Uh, and so he gathered some of his other friends to come every morning for, uh, to pray for healing for Cordell. Not asking Cordell if he needed to be healed. They just did it. And he finally left, the, Cordell that is, finally just left that Bible school. But before he left, he talked to the, the president of the school about the situation. And even the president's response was negative. He said, well, Cordell, some people are just called to stand on a corner and hand out tracts. He saw no abilities in Cordell's life. Cordell now has a series of camps for people with disabilities in the state of Ohio. He has traveled internationally. I've had the pleasure of, of serving with him on some uh, retreats that Johnny and friends has done in, in different countries. Uh, and I enjoy his presence. He is very humorous and fun to be with. Um, some of you may know uh, who Chuck Colson was. Anybody know him? That recognize that name? Uh, his uh, daughter uh, married a man, and uh, they had a son whose name was Max. Max had autism, and as one time at the house when the, he, Max was not in the sight of of his mom, uh, she heard screaming, and she came to find out what had happened and he had was trying to reach some a cookie jar or something on a high shelf and the way he tried to do that was by climbing on top of the stove but it was a gas stove and as he was climbing he turned the burner on his clothing immediately ignited and he was severely burned he's okay i mean he still has the scars but he's okay but my point is this, one of the members of the church that his daughter was part of called her when he heard about this and he said, God is trying to burn the autism out of Max. Not very comforting, is it? Why would God go to such an extreme to burn it out? Max is, is quite, well, when she wrote the book about this, uh, which is probably 10 or so more years ago, Max was uh, a helper in the church. He would show up early. He would get the seats in, all in, in line. If things needed to be dusted off, he would do that. And, and part of that was the autism, you know, his compulsiveness. Uh, and then after the church service, he would, he would help clean up and put the chairs back where they, they were before. Uh, he's contributing as best he can to serving God and to serving his people. Every life comes with boundaries. We're all susceptible to accidents and to illness that can leave us with a disability. And believe it or not, we all age. Every year it seems like we get older, right? Um, and that aging process weakens us. I need that cane now, even a year ago. I didn't need the cane, but I need that cane now. Uh, and uh, our bodies are, continue to actually lose some of our ability as we grow older. Uh, my vision is, gets worse every time I go to get my eyes checked. It's, I need a new prescription and all kinds of stuff to it. And a few years ago, I started wearing hearing aids. That's basically age process. When a person comes, becomes disabled, we're not justified if we dismiss, ignore them, or make them feel unwelcome. Uh, have we, we, we need to remember Jesus' words in John 8, verse 7, regarding the woman caught in adultery. When questions were asked about that to Jesus, he said, okay, the one of you who is without sin, you throw the fat first rock. We forget that we have sin. And we shouldn't be judging other people in that way. We're not to judge a person's worth. We cannot determine that a person is so disabled that he has or she has no purpose in God's kingdom. Max is an example of that. Uh, we do not determine, we do not determine who is worthy of salvation. 
none of us is worthy of salvation. We didn't earn it. It was a gift of grace from God. As shepherds of the flock, then we are charged with taking the gospel to all people groups. Uh, and most Christians will agree with that, but they don't think about pe people groups who are disabled. They are still ignored. And we can't just to ignore certain people thinking them to be unworthy of God's grace. If that was the case, if you had to merit God's, God's grace, we wouldn't be here today. It's grace. It's not merit. Do some shepherds in the church have a low opinion? On, and I apologize, I'm not picking on any of your church, church leaders here. I'm talking to the church. Okay. Do some shepherds in the church have a low opinion of God and assume that he cannot use a person with a disability? Especially if that disability is, is severe. Usually when I've preached here, we've had the families come, the family that we serve in the family retreats and sit up in the front. And when the music starts, uh, my, my favorite of the, 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 I'll still call her a child, I have no idea how she is, but is Soyla, who would immediately, as soon as the music starts, would get up and come to the front and, and, and dance as best she could with her limited balanced movements and and she always put her hands up like this and I always thought she's pointing at God and saying yes yes uh, I loved she shows Jesus to me she can't talk to me about him she can't do things to serve other people except that service that she does for me and helping me in in worshiping uh, the Lord Sometimes it appears as though some churches or Christians uh, think that, that is, with, who have a disability, think that God does not love them or doesn't want them to be a part of, of the flock. But the Bible is, gives us a lot of uh, details about people uh, who were different, let's just say, in that. Remember when Moses was approached uh, the, the burning bush and God said, go get the people out? Uh, what was his answer? He said, I can't talk. I stutter. I stammer. I have a speech impairment. Call somebody else. And God said, no. Who made your mouth? Who gave you a voice? It was me, God. Paul uh, whom we, we often think of as the, the, the greatest, if you can rank, rank them, of, of the apostles because so much of the New Testament was written by him. Uh, Paul had what we believe to be a visual impairment, what he called his thorn in the flesh. He never identifies it, but most people believe because of other things that he said, he, he was visually impaired and they didn't have eyeglasses for them in those days. Uh, Joshua tried to resist God's call because he's, I, I'm the youngest, I'm a youth, I, what can I do? David was ignored when a king was being sought from the, the family line because he was the youngest. Uh, and the, 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 I forget who it was that was looking for him, uh, didn't even think about David because he was a little boy or a young boy, I shouldn't say a little boy. So God is incapable of doing anything less than perfectly, right? Amen? Okay. Even with all our flaws, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, and our emotional and physical issues, we are still God's perfect creation. He doesn't see us as being imperfect if there's something that we cannot do or some limit that he has built into our lives or allowed into our lives. <clears throat> God's definition of perfection, in other words, is very different than ours. What we believe about our weaknesses, our differences, our disabilities, then really says a lot about what we think of God. And some people, non-believers, or even some people who are believers, perhaps, who become disabled, become very angry with God uh, and disappointed in God. Why would they feel awkward? Uh, people f fear becoming disabled. Uh, they fear 
what they would lose or what they think they would lose because of their disability or because they have a, a faulty uh, theology uh, and often because they don't really know anyone with a disability. Because the church as a whole has been silent regarding disability and disability ministry could be another reason that we people will resist uh, because we don't have the same mind as Paul who boasted in his weakness or disability so that the power of Christ could work uh, through him. And because we who are temporarily able-bodied have forgotten that what strength or ability we do have comes from God in the first place. It's not our own. So the shepherd shows an appropriate response. Again, the sheep who went missing is not the focus of the parable, but the shepherd's faithfulness in ministry is what is praised. The sheep is not blamed for getting lost, but the shepherd, the Christians, uh, will be held accountable for what we do or do not do to further the kingdom. Uh, we'll, we will be held accountable if we fail to be Jesus before the watching world. Some sins are sins of commission, but there are also sins of omission. But the omission is a deliberate act uh, and a judgment on our part. God says we are to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. He does not say, except to those with a disability. Don't worry about them. Failure to be obedient to Jesus' command to take the gospel to every person is a failure of love, or a failure to be Jesus in the world. Uh, they don't please God. Those actions don't please him. And we, as the shepherds, will be held accountable. The shepherd goes out to find the lost sheep, and he rejoices when it is found. His rejoicing is not just, oh, okay, now I'm not going to be judged by my boss when he finds out I lost a sheep. But he's rejoicing because the flock is full again. And God, as just as God will rejoice when we bring more people into the flock. Would the shepherd be praised by God for his good shepherding if he chose to stay uh, with the 99 who remained and, and just forget about the one who, who wandered away? Does the church, or have we chosen, the ease and comfort offered by the 99 but failed to reach out to the one who is missing. We often interpret the parable as reflecting uh, the sin of the missing sheep, <clears throat> but perhaps the sin is ours in neglecting that sheep, deciding it's not worth the effort or feeling good uh, about having the 99 and not worried about the other one. If uh, it is, is not the missing sheep who is at fault, as I said before, the fault lies with the 99 and the shepherd. How we see ourselves and how we see people with disability, even people with very severe disabilities, um, is the question that's, that we really need to consider when we think of this parable. Jesus said there will be more joy in heaven over the one sinner, whether they're able-bodied or disabled, who repents than over the 99 who don't need to repent. But who doesn't need to repent? Again, anybody here who's without sin, who never sins anymore? Uh, if, you, if there are, we want to be like you, but I don't think anybody fits that category at all. <coughs> So uh, do we who are able-bodied tend temporarily able-bodied because we could become disabled by an accident. Uh, do we need to repent of our attitudes toward people with disabilities and even their families of people with disabilities? Are we comfortable with the 99 that are our flock, satisfied with, with that, the able-bodied ones? Or do we fear people with disabilities or think they will go give a negative view to the church and to others, both Christians and non-Christians? Will we be part of the celebration when that one last one in the group has found? Okay, this, this 
I'm thinking right now this sounded more like a lecture than a sermon, but uh, but I, I hope you get you get the point. Uh, people who live with a disability, even a very severe disability, are still loved by God. Uh, they are and ought to be loved by us as we represent Jesus to them and to the world. Uh, and uh, we need to think about this parable, not about a, a sheep who has sinned and gone astray, because that doesn't tell us that at all, but about what we are doing to find the ones who are lost and bring them into the family. And do we include individuals with disabilities and the families that are of that child or in adult with a disability? Do we in include them in our scope of ministry uh, and in our uh, outreach to the world? Jesus spent a lot of time ministering to people with disabilities, and, but he could cure them. We can't. Uh, and so that's the, being cured is not the, 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 the issue here. It's being welcomed into the family of God that is the issue. It's our sharing love with others as we are told to do, uh, to be, share with the world uh, and represent Jesus in how we do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day you've given us today. Thank you for bringing us all together uh, to worship you and to sing your praises and to hear uh, from your word. I pray that you would uh, help everyone to, to understand the point that I'm trying to make and to reflect on that in, in their own life and in their own outreach and uh, fellowship with others. And if we need to be forgiven for our attitudes, uh, heal our attitudes and grant us that forgiveness. But keep our eyes open to the, the world, the whole world, to the, all the people, all the kinds of people who need Christ uh, and move us to share our love for Jesus with them by loving them and by serving them uh, in some way that we can. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you for the powerful witnesses that you have given us in the world of people with, who despite being uh, severely disabled are serving you and serving you well even those like Soila who can't express uh, in words her, her love to you, uh, is, cannot preach the gospel to us in words, but preaches the gospel very clearly in her actions and in her smile. Thank you for her um, and pray that you will continue to bless her and her mom and the family. Thank you for this day you've given us and we pray that we will be praising you throughout the day for your goodness to us and to others and your love for others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us appreciate God for his word uh, through his servant. Uh, and I believe the word of God has come uh, clearly to us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anderson. And we pray that the Lord will continue to richly bless you as you continue to minister. And thank you for bringing Mr. Ted uh, we didn't give him a chance, but he can just wave to us. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for, for supporting uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I was just reflecting on the series, uh, Taking Your Position. And I feel God is again calling us to take our position when we think about those who are different than us, uh, they may not be different. It may be us who think they are different. And God is calling us to take our position. 
when it comes to such people. I don't know who God has put in your mind today. Uh, to us as a church, it's a challenge again, and we take it, uh, and we believe there is something that God is saying to us as a church when it comes to, to those who are enabled differently. So let's be obedient to the word of God uh, as it has come to us. So thank you very much for uh, joining us in the service today, those who are uh, joining online and you who is here physically, uh, we thank God for all of you. And I want to end the service uh, with the words of Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. And I'm going to request us to stand up. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Father, we thank you for uh, your word that has come to us again as a challenge. And especially when we think about those uh, whom, Lord, you have allowed to be different than most of us. And maybe they have challenges in their, in their physical body. Lord, we again confess uh, to you uh, and ask for forgiveness because we may not have thought about them. We may not have included them as, as, as we ought to. We may not have looked them as you, as you look them, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you will help us to think and to see how we can be a blessing to them, how we can embrace them and support them as a church and even as individuals. Those we may have in our homes, we pray that, Lord, you will help us to love them and to see them just as you would see them. We know there is a reason why you allow uh, uh, them to be the way they are. So all of us, we have received this lesson, and we pray, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will help us to, to be on the lookout for these people, where we serve uh, in our job places, in our, in our schools, and even in our church, even on the way, on the road. Lord, help us to see them and to realize they too are God's creation. And they too, you have called us to reach them with the good news. So Lord, we thank you for this uh, call, this word that you have brought to us clearly today as a church. And as you walk out of this place, Lord, we thank you for speaking to us. And we pray that, Lord, as we begin this new week, uh, you will help us uh, to look and to see where, Lord, you want us to be involved with you as we continue to serve you. Lord, as your people move out of here, I pray that, Lord, you will go with them. You will go with us and lead us throughout the week. As your people have come to your house today, maybe there are those who are seeing some impossibilities in their lives, Lord. And Father, I pray that in those impossibilities, that Lord will speak to them and will see them through. And that, Lord, in all things, your will will be done. We bless your name, and we pray, thank you even for our speaker today, Dr. Anderson and Ted. May you bless them even as they, as they go back. And all of us, we commit ourselves to you uh, in Christ Jesus. For we pray all this in his name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Go well and go with the Lord. For our visitors,
uh, the ushers can guide you to the tent, uh, our visitors, Jesus the tent on my left. Christ, my King, what a beautiful name. 